Hi all, welcome back to the reading of the saga of Darren Shan, Cirque de Freak, A Living Nightmare. In the last pod we read chapters one to four. So what I want you to do to take on the role of a summarizer is pause the pod in a moment and have a think about the different things you have picked up in from reading the last uh, few chapters have a quick go at summarizing them and then press play to hear my quick summary and then the continuation of the reading okay so pause it now okay welcome back hopefully you have used um, the time to uh, quickly summarize so in summary if I was a if I took on the role of the summarizer um Chapters one to four, we were introduced to the main character, Darren Shan, and his friends, his teacher, his parents, and his sister. In the last few chapters, uh, we found out a little bit about the about freak shows, why some people were very hesitant in freak shows, and Darren Shan's teacher, Mr. Dalton, gets really angry when he sees the leaflet because they ex people who who carry out the freak shows they exploit um deformed people people who do not look dif- who look different uh, but at the end of the day they are people and it's all around exploitation people coming in um paying money to see someone who's a little bit different it is all illegal now as re- as mentioned by Darren Chan's mother and the teacher however the boys are not put off by that they are interested they are intrigued and they talk about purchasing some tickets for the uh, freak show however as they're still quite young they don't have enough pocket money um so Steve takes lead and says that he will borrow some money from his mom that he will put back in order to purchase the tickets okay so that's where we left it at we're going to find out whether Steve uh, Darren Chan's friend is able to get enough money is able to buy the tickets and whether they um go and watch the freak show okay so what we're going to do now is Today we're going to read hopefully chapters 5 to 7 with focus again on summarising these chapters but also looking at the way the writer structured um, chapter 7 to make it quite tense or tense. Um, Okay so think about those um, roles as we read, make some notes and then we'll have a quick discussion at the end. Okay, chapter 5. The next morning, Tommy, Alan and me waited outside the gates for Steve, but there was no sign of him by the time the bell rang for class, so we had to go in. I bet he's dossing, Tommy said. He couldn't get the tickets and now he doesn't want to face us. Steve's not like that, I said. I hope he brings the flyer back, Alan says. Even if we can't go, I'd like to have the flyer. I'd stick it up on my bed and... You couldn't stick it up, stupid. Tommy laughed. Why not? Alan asked. Because Tony would see it. I told him. Oh yeah, Alan said glumly. I was miserable in class. We had geography first and every time Mrs Quinn asked me a question, I got it wrong. Normally geography is my best subject because I know so much about it from when I used to collect stamps. Had a late night, Darren? She asked when I got my fifth question wrong. No, Mrs Quinn, I lied. I think you did, she smiled. There are more bags under your eyes than in the local supermarket. Everybody laughed at that. Mrs Quinn didn't crack jokes very often. And I did too, even though I was the butt of the joke. The morning dragged, the way it does when you feel let down or disappointed. I spent the time imagining the freak show. I made believe I was one of the freaks and the owner of the circus was a nasty guy who whipped everybody, even when they got stuff right. All the freaks hated him, but he was so big and mean nobody said anything. Until one day, he whipped me once too often and I turned into a wolf and bit his head off. Everybody cheered and I was made the new owner. It was a pretty good daydream. Then, a few minutes before break, the door opened and guess who walked in? Steve. 
His mother was behind him, and she said something to Mrs. Quinn, who nodded and smiled. Then Mrs. Leonard left, and Steve strolled over to his seat and sat down. Where were you? I asked in a furious whisper. At the dentist's, he said. I forgot to tell you I was going. What about... That's enough, Darren, Mrs. Quinn said. I shut up instantly. At break, Tommy, Alan and me almost smothered Steve. We were shouting and pulling at him at the same time. Did you get the tickets? I asked. Were you really at the dentist? Tommy wanted to know. Where's my flyer? Alan asked. Patience, boys, patience, Steve said, pushing us away and laughing. All good things to those, all good things to those who wait. Come on, Steve, don't mess us around, I told him. Did you get them or not? Yes and no, he said. What does that mean? Tommy snorted. It means I have got some good news, some bad news and some crazy news, he said. Which do you want to hear first? Crazy news, I asked, puzzled. Steve pulled us off to one side of the yard, checked to make sure no one was about, then began speaking in a whisper. I got the money, he said, and sneaked out at seven o'clock when Mum was on the phone. I hurried across town to the ticket booth, but do you know who was there when I arrived? Who? we asked. Mr Dalton, he said. He was there with a couple of policemen. They were dragging a small guy out of the booth. It was only a small shed, really, when suddenly there was this huge bang and a great cloud of smoke covered them all. When it cleared, the small guy had disappeared. What did Mr Dalton and the police do? Alan asked. Examined the shed, looked around a bit, then left. They didn't see you, Tommy asked. No, Steve said. I was well hidden. So you you didn't get the tickets, I said sadly. I didn't say that, he contradicted me. You got them, I gasped. I turned to leave, he said, and found the small guy behind me. He was tiny and dressed in a long cloak which covered him from head to toe. He spotted the flyer in my hand, took it and held out the tickets. I handed over the money and... You got them, we roared delightedly. Yes, he beamed. Then his face fell. But there was a catch. I told you there was bad news, remember? What is it? I asked, thinking he'd lost them. He only sold me two, Steve said. I had the money for four, but he wouldn't take it. He didn't say anything, just tapped the bit on the flyer about certain reservations, then handed me a card which said the Cirque du Freak only sold two tickets per flyer. I offered him extra money. I nearly had £70 in total, but he wouldn't accept it. He only sold you two tickets, Tommy asked dismayed. But that means, Alan began, only two of us can go, Steve finished. He looked around at us grimly. Two of us will have to stay at home. Chapter 6 It was Friday evening, the end of the school week, the start of the weekend, and everybody was laughing and running home as quick as they could, delighted to be free, except a certain miserable foursome who hung around the schoolyard, looking like the end of the world had arrived. The names? Steve Leonard, Tommy Jones, Alan Morris and me, Darren Shan. It's not fair, Alan moaned. Who ever heard of a circus only letting you buy two tickets? It's stupid. We all agreed with him, but there was nothing we could do about it apart from stand around, stubbing the ground with our feet, looking sour. Finally, Alan asked the question which was on everybody's mind. So, who gets the tickets? We looked at each other and shook our heads uncertainly. Well, Steve has to get one, I said. He put in more money than the rest of us and he went to buy them. So he has to get one. Agreed? Agreed, Tommy said. Agreed, Alan said. I think he would have argued about it. Except he knew he wouldn't win. Steve smiled and took one of the tickets. Who goes with me, he asked. I brought in the flyer, Alan said quickly. Nuts to that, I told him. Steve should get to choose. Not on your life, Tommy laughed. You're his best friend. If we let him pick, he'll pick you. I say we fight for it. I have boxing gloves at home. No way, Alan squeaked. He's small and never gets into fights. I don't want to fight either, I said. I'm no coward, 
but I knew I wouldn't stand a chance against Tommy. His dad teaches him how to box properly and they have their own punching bag. He would have floored me in the first round. Let's pick straws for it, I said, but Tommy didn't want to. He has terrible luck and never wins anything like that. We argued about it a bit more until Steve came up with an idea. I know what to do, he said, opening his school bag. He tore the two middle sheets of paper out of his exercise book and using his ruler carefully cut them into small pieces, each one roughly the same size as the ticket. Then he got his empty lunchbox and dumped the paper inside. Here's how it works, he said, holding up the second ticket. I put this in, put the top on and shake it about. Okay? We nodded. You stand side by side and I'll throw the bits of paper over your heads. Whoever gets the ticket wins. Me and the winner will have the other two, will give the other two their money back when we can afford it. Is that fair or does somebody have a better idea? Sounds good to me, I said. I don't know, Alan grumbled. I'm the youngest. I'm not able to jump as high as... Quit yapping, Tommy said. I'm the smallest and I don't mind. Besides, the ticket might come out on the bottom of the pile, float down low and be in just the right place for the shortest person. All right, Alan said, but no shoving. Agreed, I said. No rough stuff. Agreed, Tommy nodded. Steve put the top on the box and gave it a good long shake. Get ready, he told us. We stood back from Steve and lined up in a row. Tommy and Alan were side by side, but I kept out of the way so I'd have room to swing both arms. Okay, Steve said. I'll throw everything in the air on the count of three. All set? We nodded. One, Steve said. And I saw Alan wiping sweat from around his eyes. Two, Steve said, and Tommy's fingers twitched. Three, Steve yelled, jerked off the lid and tossed the paper high up into the air. A breeze came along and blew the bits of paper straight at us. Tommy and Alan started yelling and grabbing wildly, It was impossible to see the ticket in among the scraps of paper. I was about to start grabbing when all of a sudden I got an urge to do something strange. It sounded crazy, but I've always believed in following an urge or a hunch. So what I did was I shut my eyes, stuck out my hands like a blind man and waited for something magical to happen. As I'm sure you know, usually when you try something you've seen in the movies, it doesn't work. Like if you try doing a wheelie with your bike or making your skateboard jump in the air. But every once in a while, when you least expect it, something clicks. For a a second, I felt paper blowing by my hands. I was going to grab at them, but something told me it wasn't time. Then a second voice, a voice inside me yelled, Now! I shut my hands really fast. The wind died down and the pieces of paper drifted to the ground. I opened my eyes and saw Alan and Tommy down on their knees, searching for the ticket. It's not here, Tommy said. I can't find it anywhere, Alan shouted. They stopped searching and looked up at me. I hadn't moved. I was standing still, my hands shut tight. What's in your hands, Darren? Steve asked softly. I stared at him, unable to answer. It was like I was in a dream, where I couldn't move or speak. He doesn't have it, Tommy said. He can't have. He had his eyes shut. Maybe so, Steve said, but there's something in those fists of his. Open them, Alan said, giving me a shove. Let's see what you are hiding. I looked at Alan, then Tommy, then Steve, and then, very slowly, I opened my right hand fist. There was nothing there. My heart and stomach dropped. Alan smiled, and Tommy started looking down at the ground again, trying to find the missing ticket. What about the other hand, Steve asked. I gazed down at my left hand fist. I'd almost forgotten about that one. Slowly, even slower than first time, I opened it. There was a piece of green paper smack dab in the middle of my hand, but it was lying face down, and since there was nothing on its back, I had to turn it over just to be sure. And there it was, in red and blue letters, the magical name, Cirque de Freak. I had it. The ticket was mine. I was going to the freak show with Steve. Yes! I screamed and punched the air with my fist. I'd won. Chapter 7 The tickets were for the Saturday show, 
which was just as well since it gave me a chance to talk to my parents and ask if I could stay over at Steve's Saturday night. I didn't tell them about the freak show because I knew they would say no if they knew about it. I felt bad about not telling the whole truth, but at the same time, I hadn't really told a lie. All I'd done was keep my mouth shut. Saturday couldn't go quickly enough for me. I tried keeping busy because that's how you make time pass without noticing. But I kept thinking about the Cirque du Freak and wishing it was time to go. I was quite grumpy, which was odd for me on a Saturday, and Mum was glad to see the back of me when it was time to go to Steve's. Annie knew I was going to the freak show and asked me to bring her back something, a photo if possible, but I told her cameras weren't allowed. It said so on the ticket. And I didn't have enough money for a t-shirt. I told her I'd buy her a badge if they had them, or a poster, but she'd have to keep it hidden and not tell Mum and Dad where she got it if they found it. Dad dropped me off at Steve's at six o'clock. He asked what time I wanted to be collected in the morning. I told him midday, if that was okay. Don't watch horror movies, okay? He said before he left. I don't want you coming home with nightmares. Oh, Dad, I groaned. Everyone in my class watches horror movies. Listen, he said. I don't mind an old Vincent Price film or one of the less scary Dracula movies, but none of those nasty new ones, okay? Okay, I promised. Good man, he said and drove off. I hurried up to the house and rang the bell four times, which was my secret signal to Steve. He must have been standing right inside because he opened the door straight away and dragged me in. About time, he growled, then pointing to the stairs. See that hill, he asked, speaking like a soldier in a war film. Yes, sir, I said, snapping my heels together. We have to take it by dawn. Are we using rifles or machine guns, sir? I asked. Are you mad? He barked. We'd never be able to carry a machine gun through all that mud. He nodded at the carpet. Rifles it is, sir, I agreed. And if we are taken, he warned me, save the last bullet for yourself. We started up the stairs like a couple of soldiers, firing firing imaginary guns at imaginary foes. It was childish, but great fun. Steve lost a leg on the way, and I had to help him to the top. You may have taken my leg, he shouted from the landing, and you may take my life, but you'll never take my country. It was a stirring speech. At least it stirred Mrs. Leonard, who came through from the downstairs living room to see what the racket was. She smiled when she saw me and asked if I wanted anything to eat or drink. I didn't. Steve said he'd like some caviar and champagne. But it wasn't funny the way he said it, and I didn't laugh. Steve doesn't get on with his mum. He lives alone with her. His dad left when Steve was very young, and they've always argued and shouted. shouted. I don't know why. I've never asked him. There are certain things you don't discuss with your friends if you're boys. Girls can talk about stuff like that, but if you're a boy, you have to talk about computers, football, war, and so on. Parents aren't cool. How will we sneak out tonight? I asked in a whisper as Steve's mum went back into the living room. It's okay, Steve said. She's going out. He often called her she instead of mum. She'll think we're in bed when she gets back. What if she checks? Steve laughed nastily. Enter my room without being asked. She wouldn't dare. I didn't like Steve when he talked like that, but I said nothing in case he went into one of those moods. I didn't want to do anything that might spoil the show. Steve dragged out some of the horror comics and we read them aloud. Steve has great comics, which are only meant for adults. My mum and dad would hit the roof if they knew about them. Steve also has lots of old magazines and books about monsters and vampires and werewolves and ghosts. Does a steak have to be made out of wood? I asked when I'd finished reading a Dracula comic. No, he said. It can be metal or ivory, even plastic, as long as it's hard enough to go right through the heart. And that will kill a vampire, I asked. Every time, he said. I frowned. But you told me you have to cut off their heads and stuff them with garlic and toss them in a river. Some books say you have to, he agreed. But that's to make sure you kill the vampire spirit as well as his body so he can't come back as a ghost. Can a vampire come back as a ghost? I asked, eyes wide. Probably not, Steve said, but he had, if you had the time and wanted to make sure, cutting off the head and getting rid of it would be worth doing. You don't want to take any chances with vampires, do you? No, I said, shivering. 
What about werewolves? Do you need silver bullets to kill them? I don't think so, Steve said. I think normal bullets can do the job. You might have to use lots of them, but they should work. Steve knows everything there is to know about horror facts. He's read every sort of horror book there is. He says every story has at least some bit of truth in it, even if most are made up. Do you think the wolfman at the Cirque de Freak is a werewolf? I asked. Steve shook his head. From what I've read, he said, the wolfmen in freak shows are normally just very hairy guys. Some of them are more like animals than people and eat live chickens and stuff, but they're not werewolves. A werewolf would be no good in a show because it can only turn into a wolf when there's a full moon. Every other night it would be a normal guy. Oh, I said. What about the snake boy? Do you... Hey, he laughed. Save the questions for later. The shows long ago were terrible. The owners used to starve the freaks and keep them locked up in cages and treat them like dirt. But I don't know what this one will be like. There might not even be real freaks. There might only be people in costumes. The freak show was being held at a place near the other side of town. We had to leave not long after nine o'clock to make sure we got there in time. We could have got a cab except we'd used most of our pocket money to replace the cash Steve took from his mum. Besides, it was more fun walking. It was spook here. We told ghost stories as we walked. Steve did most of the talking because he knows way more than me. He was on top form. Sometimes he forgets the ends of stories or gets names mixed up, but not tonight. It was better than being with Stephen King. It was a long walk, longer than we thought, and we almost didn't make it on time. We had to run the last half kilometre. We were panting like dogs when we got there. The venue was an old theatre which used to show movies. I'd passed it once or twice in the past. Steve told me once that it was shut down because a boy fell off the balcony and got killed. He said it was haunted. I asked my dad about it and he said it was a load of lies. It's hard sometimes to know whether you should believe the stories your dad tells you or the ones your best friend tells you. There was no name outside the door and no one parked nearby and no queue. We stopped out front and bent over until we got our breath back. Then we stood and looked at the building. It was tall and dark and covered in jagged grey stones. Lots of the windows were broken and the door looked like a giant's open mouth. Are you sure this is the place? I asked, trying not to sound scared. This is what it says on the tickets, Steve said, and checked again. Just to be sure, yep, this is it. Maybe the police found out and the freaks had to move on, I said. Maybe there isn't any show tonight. Maybe, Steve said. I looked at him and licked my lips nervously. What do you think we should do? I asked. He stared back at me and hesitated before replying. I think we should go in, he finally said. We've come this far. It'd be silly to turn back now without knowing for sure. I agree, I said, nodding. Then I gazed up at the scary building and gulped. It looked like the sort of place you saw in a horror movie where lots of people go in but don't come out. Are you scared? I asked Steve. No, he said, but I could hear his teeth chattering and knew he was lying. Are you? he asked. Course not, I said. We looked at each other and grinned. We knew we were both terrified, but at least we were together. It's not so bad being scared if you're not alone. Shall we enter? Steve asked, trying to sound cheerful. Might as well, I said. We took a deep breath crossed our fingers, then started up the steps. There were nine steps leading up to the door, each one cracked and covered with moss, and went in. Right, so that's uh, the end of the couple of chapters uh, we will be reading for today's pod. Okay, so as mentioned, we're going to do a quick summary of the sections read, and then focus on the end of chapter seven, um, looking at the way the writer has structured um, the text to make it quite tense but exciting. In chapter five, um, we hear that Steve has gone to purchase the tickets. He comes to school late because he has um, a dentist appointment and the boys um, are firstly a little bit frustrated that he's not at school 
Um, but when he does come back, he tells them that he did go and he does have some news for them. The news, some of it is good, some of it is bad and some of it is crazy. Okay, so they find out what the crazy news is first. It's the fact that Mr. Dalton had um, had gone to where they sell the tickets with police um, because, as we know, it's illegal. And they find a little man um, who then suddenly disappears, which was very, very unusual for Steve. Steve thinks he's unable to buy the tickets, and as he turns around to leave, um, the little man... Um, stops him and offers him the tickets. Steve gives him the money for four tickets, but the but the man um just gives him two and points at the card where it says only two tickets per leaflet. So unfortunately, there are four friends. There are two tickets, and they have to decide on which two of the boys, which two of the friends, get to go to watch the freak show. Darren Chan suggests that Steve must be one of the ticket holders as he went to purchase the tickets as well as putting in a lot of the money um, to fund the extra tickets. And the way they choose the other ticket is by um, Steve tearing up some plain paper, mixing it in with the actual ticket and leaving it up to chance. This is the bit that's really interesting. As the two boys other two boys um scramble for the tickets on the floor uh, as you would normally if you're searching for something Darren Shan does something unusual he stands and he waits with his eyes closed with eyes closed with his hands uh palms open waiting for the ticket to possibly land in his palm there's something inside him that tells him to do this um and I guess he leaves it up to fate something unusual something that most people won't do and somehow and I guess it's meant to be that the ticket falls into his palms the other boys can't believe it but I guess they found the second ticket holder it is Darren Shan um, in the final chapter that we read today chapter seven Darren Shan stays over at um steve's house we again find out a little bit more about steve's um family life he lives with his mother his dad left when steve was a little bit younger and the relationship between steve and his mother isn't very good darren chan mentions how uh, steve speaks or refers to his mother as she um which is quite rude and disrespectful but he's never really asked why their relationship is like it is um they then play games which is sort of the beginning of this creation of tension because the games that they play are very childish immature games they are dreaming they are playing and they're having fun okay which then leads to them talking about ghosts and about vampires and getting really really into um the supernatural or the unusual Um, They discuss vampires, they discuss werewolves and Steve fully believes that even though some of these are made up, there's a little bit of truth in there which could potentially be something leading to something happening in the future. As they walk um, to the venue, to the freak show, again they continue talking about ghosts and ghost stories, creating this very fun but scary atmosphere because they don't know what they're going to see whether they're going to see real freaks whether they're going to see made up you know people dressed up but there's this this sort of almost tense atmosphere building up around them as they talk about ghosts when they arrive um and once they've caught their breath because they were running the the venue that they come to that's on the on the ticket um is the area is completely empty so there's a sense of eeriness again creating that tension there's a sense of eeriness um there's something quite unusual they don't think that they're in the right place but when they cross-reference they are 
and then they look at the building and I guess this is where we're going to be focusing on um, the structural engineer the structure when they see the building um, that the building in itself is um, creates some sort of tension there's this there's some beautiful quotations in the book, book to sort of reference these tensions. It says that it was tall and dark and covered in jagged grey stones. So there's already a sense of darkness around this building and almost gothic-like. When you think of, um, you know, a gothic building, you see very sharp, uh, triangular um, sort of architectural elements to it and it's quite jagged jagged has references to danger to um like knives and uh, broken windows like that can cut you okay and again the gray stones are quite dull creating this atmosphere of um fear almost and then it says lots of the windows were broken and the door looked like a giant's open mouth Okay, so let's just quickly look at this simile with reference to the tension that's being created. The door looked like a giant's open mouth. So a giant, okay, um, is um, again unusual um, and the mouth of a giant would definitely be very, very big. But also if we think about a giant's open mouth, when we think of an open mouth, usually it's quite dark and you're going, as you're walking into something that's mouth-like, you're almost being consumed, eaten. So there's this creation here that if they walk in, they're going to be consumed by something, they're going to be eaten by something. That's creating some sort of tension as we are questioning what is in that building and how are they being consumed? Are they literally going to be eaten or is it more metaphorical? metaphorical? It's the question there for you. Um, continuing with the structure, it then goes on, on to um, a conversation, a dialogue between Steve and uh, Darren about whether they're scared. And they sort of pretend that they're not. But as readers, we know that they are scared. As Darren said, says that he can hear um, Steve's teeth chattering. Um, but they both are really intrigued and interested and they're not going to turn back. They're going to continue um, going in. The final final line or the final paragraph <clears throat> says, we took a deep breath, crossed our fingers and started up the steps. There were nine stone steps leading up to the door, each one cracked and covered with moss and went in. It's the final paragraph, the final sentence in, in the chapter. And I guess... The fact that they go in into the unknown creates tension, but it's also really exciting for us as readers because we want to know once they're in what happens to them. Okay, right. So that's um, the chapters that we've read today. We've focused on the role of the summarizer and we've looked at structure again. Um, but today, more on the the final section as opposed to the entire chapter. OK, so hopefully my notes coincide with yours. If not, this is a really good way to start uh, thinking about um, responding to some of my questions in the way that I have just uh, modelled for you then. OK, so join me for the next few chapters of Cirque du Freak in my next pod. Thank you and we'll see you soon. Bye bye.